What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall. And today we are doing a show about birth trauma and how our mental health is affected by the medical industrial birthing complex. We have on the line from New York, Annie Robinson. Annie is a student at NYU's Gallatin School studying alternative health. Um, She's an organizer with the Icarus Project, and she is uh, in training to become a labor doula. And so it's great to have you on Madness Radio, Annie Robinson. Thank you, Will. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, Yeah, I'm really interested in doing this um, show because this is something that um, doesn't get talked about the way in in which um, the birthing process has been really medicalized and industrialized, and it harms both uh, mothers and uh, children, and we're going to be getting into that. So you're an organizer with the uh, Icarus Project, and for people who don't know, just tell us a little bit about the Icarus Project and what you've been doing at, at, at NYU. Um, So I have specifically been working sort of in um, translating some of the Icarus Project's ideas into a campus format. And the Icarus Project is a radical mental health um, organization that provides a network and a community for people who are dealing with various um, mental struggles. And Campus Icarus is the new endeavor to um, tailor that to the students. Um, on campuses throughout the country, but specifically my work has been here at Gallatin and NYU um, in the form of a student life club. And basically we just think that there are a lot of issues that are silenced and shamed um, surrounding student mental health and um, trying to open up the dialogue and create a safe space for people to explore differences in experiences um, of their mental health and uh, creating opportunity for connection to be made. What are some of the events that you guys have put on? Because I know there's been really interesting workshops and, and events that you've been doing. We actually just had one last night. It was, um, it was called Rage to Page, and it was um, with this fantastic woman named Sabrina Tapachev, who has edited a book about self-destruction and art. We actually had Sabrina on the show not too long ago, actually. She was here at NYU last night, and it was um, she facilitated this workshop where it was mostly writing exercises, learning how to assess our sort of extreme emotions and put them to a page to help deal with them and to create um, art. That's great. So what other um, workshops and events have you done? We had one last month. No, in October, that was on the political state of our country and how um, it was called the hysterical politic, and it was more of a discussion format. Um, And we talked about how the language in our culture is so focused on um, mental illness language and like the uh, psychotic state of the economy right now and all of these different things. So that was great. We do film screenings. We also have a lot of sort of more social gatherings. Um, to try and foster community. We have events in collaboration with other groups on campus. We had a holistic health fair last spring, and we're planning another one for this spring where we bring all different kinds of alternative health, mental and physical and et cetera. So this is a way to reach out to students um, on campus um, who may be dealing with mental health issues. Maybe they take medications or they have a diagnosis of bipolar or something, and then now they have a group to come to and they can talk about these issues, but it's really open to the whole community as well, right? It's open to everyone. It's open whether you have a diagnostic label or not, whether you're on drugs or not, whether you are um, seeing a therapist or not. And it's also not, uh, it's, it's whatever, wherever you're at. Now, how did you get interested in this? I know you yourself have been in the mental health system. Tell us about that and how that went for you. Um, that's actually, that's completely why I'm here, um, very much derived from personal experience. Um, I have been bouncing around, struggling with um, my own 
mental health uh, for years. I was, um, as a child, I experienced what I, I experienced intense emotions, I guess would be one way to put it. And by middle school, I was seeing um, a, I started to see a counselor and which led to a psychiatrist. And when I was, I think I was 13 when I was put on meds for the first time. At first it was, um, I'd been diagnosed with quite a few labels. Doctors did not seem to be able to make up their minds as the years went on. Um, I was um, first diagnosed as depressed and then having anxiety and then actually I dealt a lot with post-traumatic stress disorder. My um, best friend died when we were in eighth grade and followed shortly by my cousin who passed away. So I um, was put on meds around that period. So I was 14. Um, and I also have been dealt with an eating disorder for years. Um, about three years ago, they just... Um, the doctor who I was seeing at the time decided that I was bipolar by her definition. I've also, another doctor thought for a while that I was um, borderline. And so I've been on antipsychotics, antidepressants, um, anti-anxiety um, medications and have done all kinds of, I've done a lot of uh, CBT work was um, a focus for me in high school and I ended up, um, I started college at Smith College um, where I was for a year and a half and then I left to do a rehabilitation program for um, just self-destructive behavior um, generally. Now when you say that you were as a kid having a lot of extreme emotions, what was that like for you? Were you crying a lot or was it just kind of I anger? had a lot of rage. I had a lot of um I would ha I think sort of in middle school is when I started to really have like my low lows, but I was also like I had really high highs and I was a really my mother always describes me as an incredibly sunny child, but um just felt things intensely. Re was was really con was really connected and enveloped in my feelings, which then very much was curtailed by the getting into um, the systematic sort of process of you know diagnosing and treating mental health. I shut down and I was numb and all of, all of this stuff. And from the uh, medications were numbing you and curtailing your emotions. Feeling like I was supposed to feel shame about about the feelings I was having and my emotional experiences. Um, so it was both um, sort of the chemical process and uh, social perception. So sort of becoming the identity of someone who had a disorder or an illness or something. Yes. And that's very much continued to be a struggle of mine is figuring out how to um, not feel shamed and um, isolated by those identifications, but that I can even embrace sort of these experiences that I have um, and still feel included in communities and, and so forth, which is a lot of what led me to Icarus because that's very much um, the principle behind it. Was there anything in the in the kind of treatments that you got as a child? It sounds like they put you on a lot of different medications. Was there any kind of benefit or positive aspect to it? Like, did it help you to cope and deal with school and deal with your friends better? Or? You know, I my response to that is always that, yes, it helped in so far as it got me to where I am today. Um, and it, you know, I went through, I feel like I've been to hell and back. And I think that that has very much shaped who I am today, I guess. It's just sort of my way of reasoning that. And, you know, at the time, sure, maybe it, it was really helpful. It also had a lot of traumatic effects, but um, nothing's as simple as being, in my opinion and in my experience, nothing's as simple as, you know, meds good or meds bad. What was some of the downsides for it? You say it was a whole traumatic experience as well. I think that it shaped my sense of self and my sense of um, of my ability to cope on my own, and it really formed a dependence on um, finding 
first of all, it affirmed like you're broken, you need to be fixed, that mentality. And then also looking to external sources to do that fixing. Whereas um, what I really embrace now is that my wellness comes from myself and my own self-care, um, which may involve any number of um, me reaching out to any number of things, but being put on meds while I was, you know, a minor in that sense um, was very disempowering. Also, it I um, when I was on, especially being on the antipsychotics, I was completely dissociative and completely disconnected from my surroundings and more importantly from myself. And I went through a two-year period where I was incapable of shedding a tear and um, when I really desperately needed to be grieving in a much more um, physical, whole body connected manner and was unable to do so. Do you have any like lasting negative effects? I mean, that sounds really painful, not being able to cry for, for so long. Do you have any, are you having any lasting effects from the medications that you took? Or It's a daily struggle. I think I still struggle to feel my feel to allow myself to feel my feelings. I really learned and ingrained the shutting down and the putting boundaries up. And as soon as I feel a feeling like going into retreat or getting, getting, numbing myself out as sort of an instinct. And I, I am continually working on unlearning basically what I learned in, a, in sort of that self-protective mode at that time. So it's ongoing. I'm so much better and I um, am really feel empowered and, and so forth at this point with my health, but um, no doubt if there are resonating um, effects from that. Um, Annie, how did this experience that you had with the medications and the mental health system um, as a kid, how did that sort of play a role in your current interest in um, the politics of birthing and becoming a labor doula and being involved um, with childbirth? First of all, I guess um, I see sort of from a societal systematic viewpoint, the problems with the mental health system and the problems with maternal services um, are almost parallel um, in as far as there's so much pathologizing and um, just the medicalization of these experiences in life that don't necessarily, in my opinion, have to be seen uh, or approached in a way that requires such um, institutional and scientific um, control and manipulation and involvement. Um, I think that uh, there are many of the many shared um, experience, emotional experiences in going through the mental health system and in going through um, birth in a maternity ward in a hospital today. Um, Say a little bit more about that, the parallels. Is, is it about the way in which so much power and control is put into the hands of, of doctors and the whole experience is turned into a, a kind of like a problem illness to be treated? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it's one of the things that infuriates me most in life right now is how um, birth is seen as a, it's treated like it's a disease. And it's like the farthest thing from that the most um, organic and essential and natural and beautiful process. And it is seen as like how, you know, as soon as you go into the hospital, you're hooked up to a fetal monitoring system to be measured. And um, you have just one intervention after the next um, that are all in the name of medicine, in the name of science, in the name of safety and truth, and it's approached like it's um, this huge risk, and there are all these problems that could occur, so let's be incredibly aggressive in our treatment of it, instead of taking an approach that's that ha- with a mentality of, this is, a pro- that your body knows how to do this, you're made to do this, as a woman, you're made to give birth, and let's trust that process, and, you know, have the knowledge and awareness of potential adverse effects that have and can occur, but to it's, it's coming at it in a different way. 
So what are some of the examples of, of how this, um, the medical industrial approach to, to birthing can, can be harmful and what, what actually goes on that you have problems with? The rate of inductions is incredibly troubling um, because what happens is that when mothers, and I also, I mean, I will say, I will offer the disclaimer that it's okay if a mom decides she wants to have an epidural, like, and it's okay. It's more, my, my primary concern is that the mother knows the pros, the cons, and the options of every, um, every thing that's offered. That's an informed consent issue, which right. is very parallel to... It's informed consent, but it's also this idea that um, is actually promoted by um, this great... Uh, the Coalition for Improving Maternity Services, um, they have the right to informed refusal, which seems more relevant today when the doctor will come in and say, your baby needs this. Are you going to be a bad mom and um, refuse this care? And so you, there's this pressure and this sense that you can't say no to something the doctor says. The doctor will say, you know, you're taking to, you know, your cervix isn't dilated enough and we really need to get going, and so I think we're going to have to induce your labor. And that's really, really troubling and stressful because these are your first decisions as, or some of your first decisions as a mother, and do you want to be labeled as a bad mother by endangering the risk of your child um, by not doing what the doctor, and, and you know, it's so much a doctor knows best mentality. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. I like the phrase informed <laughs> refusal. It's very interesting, the, the, the parallels with the mental health system, because that's often it's often held up as, okay, look, this is a life or death issue. There's a life at stake. It's yours. It's yours. It's not the baby's, but it's yours. And unless you trust me to make the decisions for you, then you're right. going to do something terrible and something terrible is going to happen. And, and it's very, it's interesting. It's a parallel mentality. It's a parallel phenomenon. So when you said induction and epidurals, when pe people may not know what that is all about and what's the problem with using them so frequently, which is what, what you've mentioned. Well, um, quite frequently when um, inductions are used, uh, there, I mean, I, there are sort of the medical side effects and then there are the um, emotional side effects. And I so think and that... by induction, you mean making the labor progress through an external intervention? Is that what that means? Exactly, exactly. Intervention, um, interventive medicine um, in a pregnancy instead of waiting for the labor to... Pro I mean, labor is supposed to take a really long time. And, you know, it's supposed to take 18 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours. And it's going to be different for everyone. And even when labor begins is debatable. You know, you're given a due date, but by and large, that's pretty arbitrary. Like the baby will come when the baby's ready to come. Your body will know when the baby's going to come. And so to, um, for example, um, to break the uh, sack of amniotic fluid is one in one of the first interventions, which is inducing labor, um, which basically starts the labor process, starts your cervix dilating before the before that's happened naturally. And that can be incredibly traumatic for the baby, I think, emotionally, as well as for yourself. Your body's, you know, failing somehow, not doing something right um, according to the standards and the expectations within the medical system. Other examples of intervention are like when forceps, this, this forceps are less common today than they were um, maybe 20 years ago. Um, but like forceps are during the second stage of labor to speed up delivery um, and they're actually clamped on. I was a forceps baby and these metal forceps were clamped onto my head and that, you know, helped yank me out um, instead of just letting me, you know, squeeze and slide out as, as at the rate that I was ready to come. Um, and uh, episo episiotomies are another example um, of, a occasionally unnecessary um, incision that's made um, to enlarge the vagina instead of just waiting for it to open as it will do <laughs> with time. I'm also thinking of uh, cesarean sections are also very, yeah. very excessively used. Slicing into the abdomen and then pulling the baby out rather than having a natural vaginal birth. 
most often what will happen when um, drugs are used is when you get either a spinal or an epidural, there's sort of this um, cyclical effect that happens between Pitocin and which is something a uh, an intervention um, used is an intravenous fluid that you'll get that um, speeds up the contractions to progress labor and it's incredibly painful then because you're having these contractions that aren't naturally produced and really traumatizing for the baby and then it's really painful so they'll give you usually a mother will then have an epidural. And usually what happens then is the cervix doesn't have enough time to dilate fully for a vaginal birth, and so they'll end up rushing um, the mother in for a cesarean, which is also problematic because the baby is usually not ready to come out and um, has a lot of trouble breathing, and the lungs are the last thing that are developed. And so to not give the baby all of its time to, you know, be ready to come out, it's... uh, going to have issues, no doubt. No and doubt. you mentioned epidurals, and that is that a painkiller that's used for the mother yes. for the labor pains? Yes. And what are the possible, yes. and I, I really recognize what you said about not judging people, anybody who's listening who you know, has had a, a hospital birth or had any of these interventions, this is not about judging your choices, we're just trying to understand better um, what people go through, but what are the implications of having an epidural that people should be aware of? Um, I think that, that I mean, first and foremost, the message then is that you can't do it, you know? You aren't capable of dealing with this pain, and we are all capable of so much more than we um, believe. And, you know, I, one of my favorite metaphors is to compare labor and the birthing process to running a marathon. And, like, yeah, that it's, it's, it's really freaking, like, intense and vigorous and there's pain involved but it's it's bearable you know you are your body if you've trained right if you are have the right mentality you can do it no question and to say like oh give me the meds give me the meds you can do it yourself and to to feel empowered and capable and believing that you and your baby are able to go through see this journey to the end on your own is a really powerful um message that I think has lasting effects on your relationship with your child and on your own relationship with yourself um, and so forth. So just from the doctor's point of view and the hospital's point of view, I know that there's insurance company pressure, for example, around using cesareans um, really, really unnecessarily. What's kind of the logic behind what the medical establishment is doing? You're mentioning the word speed and how long it's taking. I mean, is that one of the things that's uh, considered a problem when labor is too long? And, and, and let's talk about this claim that doctors make and hospitals make that, well, this is really in the, in the baby's best interest. The, doc- the doctors in the hospitals will claim medical reasons for inductions of labor and um, for interventions. And... Um, but really what's happening is that um, as these reasons to induce labor have it's increased the intervention rate um, over the last 10, 15 years um, as they're trying to, schedules are getting busier. And it is, it's a matter of how many beds do you have available in a maternity ward and how fast can you turn out patients, you know. Um, it's really, and also, I mean, also from the other, another point of view, mothers, who are working moms and they're having to get back to work quickly and stuff like that will plan and schedule their cesarean sections to just get this over with and get back on track. And um, it's it's really disturbing the priorities, um, I think, that are um, driving these decisions. Is that really exaggerated, the idea that, you know, these are necessary interventions because otherwise the child is going to die or potentially could die? Absolutely. On occasion, there are reasons to that we need we need medicine. I mean, thank God we have Western medicine in so many ways. We we re- I do think we do need it. You know, back in the in the times of our ancestors, there was huge numbers of um, maternal mortality rate and infant mortality rate, which are by no means not issues now, but they've been lessened and transformed in in various ways. But I think it isn't an exaggeration. Um, When you look at it, 
from a non-medical perspective. So, you know, if, if there was a doctor on the line here, like, no question, there would be, and when you see interviews with doctors and so on and so forth, it's always that there's, there really is medical risk. There really is scientific backing and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, when it comes down to it, I think that it's just part of the business that perpetuates those ideas. And I think what you said before about informed consent or informed uh, the right to refuse, informed refusal, um, you know, it, it really is a question of, of risks versus benefits because these interventions are being claimed that, oh, hey, this has no implications. There's, It's not going to hurt your baby. It's not going to hurt you. In fact, the whole idea of birth trauma, which we're going to talk about in a moment, isn't even really recognized by medical science. It's very uh, controversial, oh, and I want to yeah. I want to hear about your views about that. But um, that sort of gets to the heart of why we're why we're doing this show. I mean, there's a human rights aspect to the birthing process itself, and medical ethics, and how do we treat each other and treat uh, children and treat mothers. But also, there's this question of what kind of connection is there between birthing experiences that are violent, which is what we're describing. Um, yeah. that include medical interventions and later problems that a person has in their life. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and our guest today is Annie Robinson. We are talking about birth trauma. Are mental health issues um, related to birth trauma issues, and can we prevent mental health problems by having healthy, natural birthing? And to address this, I want to talk about um, R.D. Lang. And people know I've talked about R.D. Lang before. He's a, a very prominent Scottish um, psychiatrist who led a lot of the charge in the 60s and 70s to um, completely overturn psychiatry and have much more of a human rights and spiritual and creative uh, focus. He was a real maverick in the profession and um, wrote a lot about the problems of psychiatry. And he's very much an inspiration to a lot of us involved in uh, psychiatric um, organizing and mental health organizing and survivor organizing. Later on in his career, he got very interested in birth trauma. People may not know about this because he was kind of considered to have sort of lost his marbles and kind of became a quack towards the end. But actually, I think he was really onto something. Um, and uh, even though you don't really hear much about his later books, his all of his books are really interesting. Um, but one of his later books is called The Facts of Life, and it's all about the birthing process. And I'll just read you a little section here. Um, when the cord is cut, the umbilical cord is cut immediately after birth, the instant the cord is cut between the two places it has just been tied, there may be a jerk of the whole baby, including fingers and toes. I have seen a global organismic reaction occur the instant the cord is cut. It would appear to be neurologically impossible. There are no nerves in the umbilical cord, but it does happen. I've seen it happen. It does not always happen, however. Therefore, there is some transmission of a very fast and global order mediated somehow between the site of the cut through the cord, transmitted, it seems, to neural tissue from non-neural tissue. This presum presumably must happen somehow. How it does happen is totally unknown. However, the fact that it does happen settles the question about whether it can happen. The issue as to whether it does happen can be settled very soon by direct observation on those babies born in good enough shape to be reacting in a healthy way. This observation alone impels us to admit that there must be a domain of ignorance stretching further than we can peer. So medical science says that when you cut an umbilical cord um, that it doesn't affect the baby negatively and he's Lang was a doctor, and he says he's actually seen babies spasm when that happens. So clearly there is some kind of effect, possibly traumatic effect, happening on the baby when uh, the umbilical cord is, is cut. And then we take that example and then generalize. We can say that this entire experience of modern hospital birthing may be having all kinds of impacts on children who, have, of course, then grow up to have potentially mental health problems or traumatic stress problems. Annie, tell us, tell us about this whole question of, of how birth trauma might affect us as we grow up and become adults. So birth trauma is um, seen as either um, a physical injury sustained by an infant during birth 
or sort of more speaking towards what we're talking about here is the psychological shock um, many believe can be experienced by an infant during birth. Um, and I would extend the definition to saying um, there's also birth trauma for the mother, um, but that takes it in a little bit of a different direction. But the trauma around birth um, was brought to public attention also around, actually almost around the exact same time that um, The Facts of Life was published was the French obstetrician, uh, Dr. Frederick Le Boyer, um, wrote Birth Without Violence, which um, was a book that was conveying the idea of um, the trauma that happens to children during during those moments and that is increasingly an issue. Um, even though all this stuff was happening in the 70s, it's only gotten worse since the 70s in many ways um, in terms of in hospital births, the potential side effects of um, traumatic, invasive um, first, you know, entry into the world. And uh, one of the things in terms of the idea that you brought up about the um, cutting of the cord, what needs to happen is, assume, I mean, that's one of the first things that happens when the baby comes out of the mother's womb is immediately the cord is, is snapped. And Now, I am not a doctor, so I don't know um, about the actual physiological experience of that, of what of what that is, of what nerves are are, are not touched by that. Um, so if the baby actually feels it in a physical sense, but in a, an emotional sense, there's no doubt that this baby has grown and all it's known is oneness with the mother and it's immediately whisked away from the mother, snapped literally and physically from the mom and Instead of being placed on the mother's stomach, which is the natural place for it to go back to, um, although outside the womb still to be at that point and work its way up to the breast to feed, which is what a baby does when left um, to its own devices, it's whisked away for all of these foreign, I mean, violent, traumatizing um, tests and foreign hands and cold hands. I mean, think how cold a baby is when it comes out um, of the womb and to not then be able to bond with the mother um, by exchanging body warmth and all the hormones that are being released, all the oxytocin, which is like happiness basically and love, the, the love hormone, um, which is needs to be exchanged between mom and, and baby. Um, None of that can happen when um, the the process um, in sort of typical hospital births at this point. In terms of the long term effects, I think that if you just think about what all of this potentially entails, how scary it is to be ripped away from someone, from all you've known, from um, you know looking at it in a more um, metaphoric sense. There's no doubt to me that it has implications for later experiences. I can bring in a little bit of my own my own background, my which I've been sort of exploring since I've um, gotten increasingly involved in the, the birth world um, and as a doula myself. Part of my um, motivation for being a labor doula was my own story. Um, my I was adopted and my Mother was 16 when she, um, my biological mother was 16 when she found out she was pregnant. And she was, I mean, it was a very highly, highly intervened in um, process. Uh, I was a forceps baby. She had an episiotomy without being clearly told what an episiotomy was, what was happening. They had numbed her. She was given drugs. Um, I was, you know, torn from her. And then Further, beyond that, I was not allowed time to bond with her. And then even if I had bonded with her, I, you know, several days later was given to my parents now, my adopted parents who adopted me. I definitely, I mean, I connect that to my ongoing lifelong themes of um, struggling with um, feeling alone and feeling abandoned and scared of abandonment and feeling unwanted and unloved, as nurturing and loving and and solid as my environment was growing up, um, there was 
a lot of resounding trauma um, from both the birth process and the adoption process. Um, it's really interesting to look at that, the discovering your own birthing process and then how it might connect with patterns with your own mental wellness. I can tell the story that I know of my own birth um, is that my mom was in labor with me and the labor was going on and on, like you were saying, and they decided, the doctor decided, well, this has just gone on too long, so we're going to induce this pregnancy, this, uh, this birth. And when they were about to induce the birth, um, that's when I came out. And so <laughs> it's kind of like this metaphor, this symbol of coming into the world under threat, like you don't want to come out, you don't want to come mm -hmm. out, and then you're forced to, which if people who know me, <laughs> and I know personally, I mean... Uh, that's a big theme and pattern in my own, in my own life. The sense of just, um, you know, not not belonging, and then also being being, doing things under under some kind of threat of, of danger of medical intervention. And of course, a lot of my work as an adult is all about medical violence and about <laughs> medical abuse. Yeah. So, what are some of the yeah. other long term effects that you feel like you've experienced? Just this sense of the world being a scary place. Um, because if that's if you're if you're when you're born and you're born into you know the harsh I mean this also goes into a lot of my theories about a birth, the environment of um, where women birth and where you know how children are received into this world and I think that it should be you know low lighting and soft voices and warmth and um, water is a really beautiful way to give birth. Um, and peaceful music or breathing and all these different things, and which so contrasts, you know, you think of um, which the, the highly dramatized um, maternal ward images that are on TV and all of this where, you know, it's really harsh lighting and everybody's screaming and rushing around and um, it's like push and yelling and like the doctor has on those like awful gloves and all of this, all of this stuff and then the cold... Um, the cold metal tools and instruments and everything. And it's, that's, that's a terrifying place to, you're, you know, you're coming from this really warm, delicious womb where you've grown and um, your mom has, you've gone through this then labor process with your mom. And all you want then is to sort of like be embraced as, which is all you've ever known is this, this warmth and, and comfort and um, being held and, and all this stuff. And immediately you're just sort of like this, there's just this panic and this energy in the air that to me definitely like is another metaphor that I can use in my own daily experience of the world is like learning to find that tranquility and find that peace in a world that is definitely, you know, hectic and panicky and all of that but that you can you can find you can find the peace but um it's the idea that like a baby a baby needs to be you need to give that to them at that stage they don't know how to create that for themselves but as mother and as a parent and as the midwife or doula and other healthcare providers you can create that um it's, it's a choice now, I know that there's been research uh, looking at breastfeeding and how um, babies that are breastfed have um, better mental health um, overall in their lives as well as better physical health. Are, is there research that goes beyond that and talks about natural birthing and more healthy, um, nonviolent way of giving birth leading to the kinds of things that you're talking about in terms of a lower anxiety and greater sense of, of belonging and and those kinds of things? The organization I brought up earlier, the um, Coalition for Improving Maternity Services, um, has done some great, and I would definitely recommend people going there. It's um, www.motherfriendly.org. And they did a phenomenal, they do just tons of great studies. But the problem, one of the things that they point out is that there isn't a lot of, you know, study, there's not a lot of reporting on um studying natural birth because where's the money coming from for that? You know, all of the funding of all the studies that say, you know, we need this or we need that is all, it's all within the medical establishment. It's just another sort of corrupt issue in, um, in medicine, um, medical world. 
which is again a parallel with the psychiatric issue. The mental health, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. But one of the, they did do this great study that you can get the um, on on their site called Listening to Mothers Report. They did it in 2006, and it all comes from. Um, I think it included mothers who had natural home births, to natural births in hospitals, to all to cesareans, a huge range, range, a diverse um, population was included. But it was listening to the mom's stories and, and their voices and their experiences. And, and similarly, um, Ina Mae Gaskin, who's sort of the founder of um, like the nation's leading midwife and the founder of the um, home birth movement in the 70s, um, she very much um, advocates this idea of listening to women's stories. And that is where... Um, the evidence will come from. Um, unfortunately, it's you know not quote unquote scientific and um, or widespread, um, and I think that that's one of the biggest issues we face um, as a culture right now is learning to in for mental health for mothers um, empower people to use their voices in ways that don't necessarily have to conform to the ways that it's like socially condoned to speak about your mental health or speak about your birthing experience. Um, so if people are listening and they're considering um, having a kid or or they're in the process of, of a pregnancy and they're thinking about um, how they want to, want to um, have the actual birth happen, what kinds of advice would you give and what kinds of things should they be looking for? Do people really need to go with a midwife um, and a home birth, or are there intermediate kinds of options? And one of the reasons I asked this is I have a friend who recently gave birth to a really wonderful, um, healthy uh, little boy. And uh, my sense from her experience is that she was kind of tricked a little bit, that that they told her it was going to be more natural than it was. And then at one point, the doctor just came in and says, well, actually, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And then it was an on-the-spot kind of thing. So tell us a little bit about that. That's, I mean, that is huge. That is a huge problem is that um, OBGYNs and everything, as much as you, you know, talk beforehand or even come up, a lot of women come up with a birth plan of what they want. You know, I don't want drugs, but then it all changes in the moment. And to not have the support in the moment um, and advocates really feeling like you have advocates who are going to say, like, you know what, this is not what we asked for. This is not what we talked about. That is definitely where I will plug um, doulas. And um, doulas are, and I'm a labor doula. There's also um, the postpartum doula um, who works with mothers after the birth. But a labor doula works with a mother, um, gives, provides continuous support, meaning from as soon as, um, meaning she will be by your side from the early stages of labor through to help initiate breastfeeding um, many, many hours later, um, and providing educational support, emotional support, physical support. I it, incorpor- it can incorporate a lot of um, techniques, massage techniques and different um, positions and moving. And it's very much about, it's very much um, focused on non-interventive support um, in the physical process, emotional encouragement, um, it really can be incredibly helpful for dads for there to be a doula so that a doula can guide the dad in, or the partner um, in um, figuring out the best support that they can provide to the mom. Um, now, often when we get into discussions about alternatives, um, it becomes a class issue. So is, is, is there anything on the horizon or is there a movement or political pressure happening to get doulas and midwives to be funded by insurance companies and by um, the health policies in the country as a whole? I, I don't think so. Um, but I do know that there's a lot of um, effort to ha- to train community members as doulas um, in sort of services. Like I, I actually work... Um, I've been offering my services in a volunteer capacity to teenage girl, uh, ladies who are pregnant. Um, and that there's a, sort of, as doulas are becoming a more um, widely known um, profession, 
um, there is definitely sort of this incentive to train people um, within communities um, who are not going to have the same access to the financial um, resources and stuff that enable most women to have uh, doulas at their birth. Annie, is, um, it, is it better in other countries? Are there countries that have policies yeah. around this <laughs> that we would want to hold up as examples? Oh, God, the Netherlands, um, anywhere in Europe, Japan. I mean, even even the, the shocking thing is that even in the other, you know, highly industrialized um, nations like Japan and like Europe and highly developed, uh, they do it so much better. They just get it. And it has a lot to do with there are such high, I mean, there are issues. Absolutely there are issues. And especially, but mostly what it is is the Western medical model um, you know, it's global expansion and um, you know, trying to change how things are done in these other countries that are doing them so well with midwives being the, you know, prominent way that um, women are receiving health care um, during their um, prenatal health care and postnatal health care. And maybe, and, uh, maybe one of the things we need to look at is whether the countries that are using midwives and doulas, um, whether, whether one of the reasons that those countries are less violent in general compared to the United States is related to this birth trauma issue. Annie, we are just about out of time. Give us uh, contact information, how people can get in touch with you, and also mention again that website um, for people who are interested in doulas okay. and midwifery and natural birthing. Um, the Coalition for Improving Maternity Services is great for, um, especially for moms. They have 10 steps to mother-friendly care, um, which, and some other resources that are really great in terms of figuring out how to go about, who to get in touch with, and what questions to ask and stuff. And that's www.motherfriendly.org. Um, Dona International is how is where I've received my training as a doula. For, um, they have resources for mothers and for people who are interested in getting involved in other capacities, being trained as a doula and so forth, and that's www.donainternational.org. Dona, D-O-N-A, international. D-O-N-A, yep, which originally was doulas of North America, so now they've expanded to international status. And how can people get in touch with you if they need to? Um, email me at AnnieWRobinson at gmail.com. Or if you're interested in um, my doula services, um, if you want, you can email me at Mighty Mamas, which is M-I-G-H-T-Y-M-A-M-A-S at gmail.com. Annie Robinson, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you, Will. You've been listening to an interview with Annie Robinson. She is a student at NYU's Gallatin School studying alternative health. She's an organizer with the Icarus Project, which is an alternative mental health support network, and she is studying to be a labor doula. That is all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Co produced by peer run mental health communities Freedom Center.org and The Icarus Project.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness, radio to help get us broadcast on a station near you or if you just want to share what's in your head contact radio at madnessradio.net